Okay, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, I am Cole Harrison, Executive Director of Massachusetts Peace Action. Uh, welcome to our program on global cooperation or new Cold War, the people's foreign policy. Although the U.S. has a dangerous reactionary politics that controls the presidency, the Senate, and most state legislatures, the people's movement in the United States has also moved forward with a powerful response, including the nationwide wave of protests in defense of black lives, support for immigrant rights, action on climate change, new labor activism in response to the COVID crisis and the Bernie Sanders campaign and other electoral efforts. But what is this progressive movement's foreign policy? The peace and anti-war movements have been relatively quiet in recent years, even though the Trump administration is squeezing Iran, Venezuela, Bolivia, Yemen, Korea, and more, supporting Israel's unilateral annexations, tearing up arms control treaties, and rapidly increasing military spending. Democrats are continuing to conduct a campaign of fear and hostility against Russia, and both parties are rapidly turning towards confrontation with China, breaking off trade relations and ramping up military threats. So our topic tonight is to take a look at the key foreign policy challenges that face the progressive movement. For this, we have two panelists. Uh, to speak with us. Max Elbaum has been active in peace, anti-racist, and radical movements since he joined SDS in Madison, Wisconsin in the 1960s. The third edition of his book, Revolution in the Air, 60s Radicals Turned to Lenin, Mao, and Che, was released by Verso in 2018. He was editor of War Times, a free anti-war weekly during the anti-Iraq war movement of the early 2000s and he is now a member of the editorial collective of Organizing Upgrade, founded in 2017 to gather left organizers to discuss strategy and share organizing models that respond to the profound dangers and the real opportunities of this political moment. Toby De Chow is the director of Justice is Global, a special project of people's action that is building a movement to create a more just and sustainable global economy and to defeat right-wing nationalism around the world. Toby has been organizing campaigns for corporate accountability and racial and economic justice in Chicago since 2009. He was a key leader in bringing Moral Mondays to Illinois, and he served as chair of the board of directors of the People's Lobby. He holds a master's degree in philosophy from the University of Chicago and a master's degree in divinity from the Lutheran School of, she of Theology at Chicago. Tonight's event is presented by Massachusetts Peace Action, Organizing Upgrade and Justice is Global. After this event, Massachusetts Peace Action hopes to hold a follow-up meeting for Massachusetts activists to focus on the danger of a new, war, new Cold War and great power confrontation. During the conversation, you can put your questions in the chat or use the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom window and click raise hand. I've asked each panelists to speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll take questions and discussion after that. Max Albon. Uh, thank you, Cole, and nice to see everybody here. Uh, in a recent column on organizing the upgrade, I wrote, the fight against US wars and for international solidarity is currently the weakest link in the opposition to the Trump administration's program of racist authoritarian rule. If Trump loses in November and can be forced out of office, building opposition to US militarism and the foreign policies of a Biden administration will likely be the social justice movement's biggest challenge. So those are the reasons uh, that discussions like the one we're having uh, now are very important. We have many, many crucial tasks in front of us, but we can't let addressing this weakness fall through the cracks. And the heartening thing is that, uh, like the people on this call, there are many people all across the country and across the world who are taking this up. Uh, so to kick off this discussion, uh, I'm gonna address in my remarks three, three topics. Uh, first, the Brief, some brief reminders of why internationalism is important. 
Second, a brief look at what we're up against in terms of the Trump administration and administration we face after November. And third, and I'll try to focus a little more on this, some ideas about how we can build some clout and might be some ways that we can turn this weak spot in our resistance movement into a strong point. So on to the first point. Uh, at least in theory, internationalism has been a, always been a cornerstone of progressive movements in the left. It encompasses the fight for peace, against militarism, against interventionism and bullying, solidarity with peoples and countries fighting for freedom, and global cooperation against common threats to the human race. And it's an extremely urgent practice in today's interconnected world, and especially for those of us here in the United States. Because even with the weakening of US economic power over the last few decades, this is still the center of an exploitative and unjust global capitalist system. In today's world, there's not a single country that can attain democracy, much less economic self-determination without support from peoples in other countries and around the world. An injury to one is an injury to all. That principle we have to apply globally, not just locally or nationally. Our responsibility to be in solidarity with workers and oppressed people struggling everywhere, it's not just charity. It strengthens those who are fighting against our common enemy. And it's also crucial to put our own movements on a firm and durable foundation. If we're not internationalist in our vision and in our practice, we're vulnerable to the, what ruling classes have done uh, for hundreds of years, which is wave the flag and try to line everybody up behind the nas so-called national interests to fight their wars and to demonize people in other lands. And when that happens, our movements get weakened and subordinated to the agenda of those who are oppressing and exploiting us and the people that we might be drawn into conflict with in other countries. And it's been especially urgent, internationalism is especially urgent in today's world with the level of the destructiveness of nuclear weapons and the dangers of climate change Peace and cooperation among peoples across the world is crucial not just for social change, but even for the very survival of human civilization. Now, with everything on activists' agenda, it's, uh, we can understand why these kinds of issues sometimes get pushed to the bottom of the list. But it's a fatal, it'll be fatal for us if we don't find ways to change them. So what are we up against? Uh, we are up against the ruling class that has been on top of the world for decades. And even with its loss of economic power and the decline of its soft power, its in, in, intangible propaganda influence, it's got the most powerful military in the world and it's determined to hold on to global hegemony. It holds foreign policy closest to the vest it's the part of politics that's the least, least accessible to democratic oversight, supervision, and change. And we've seen it over decades. This is not a new phenomenon in the Trump administration with the rise of what's been called the imperial presidency and what's been called the national security state. But the guardians of empire don't see eye to eye on how to maintain their global hegemony. It's inevitable under capitalism that different sections of the capitalist class and different political representatives are gonna have different views and strategies about what's the best way they can maintain their power. Sometimes those differences are only small ones. They don't matter very much, but at other times, those differences can be extremely consequential. And it's important for us to understand, just as important for us to understand and take advantage of those differences as it, is, as it is to be clear that what we're up against fundamentally is a system of class domination 
and not just one or another particular policy or mistake. Today, I think the differences between the two main factions of capital as expressed in the Republican and Democratic Party are reasonably consequential. Trump's foreign policy is an extension of his domestic policy. Racism, authoritarianism, reliance on force, no credibility to scientific evidence. So what we see is unilateralism instead of diplomacy, constant reliance on the threat of force or the use of force in assassination, backing for authoritarian and racist regimes across the globe, racist demonization of people in the global south, his so-called shithole countries, denial that people across the globe have any common interests at all under his slurs and his argument that everybody else is just going to put their covers. There's no basis for coming peoples in different countries. Now, Trump has a patent of uh, being an anti-war candidate because he's been risk averse in terms of deploying large numbers of U.S. soldiers in wars that would, where they would sustain a lot of casualties. This, uh, he's doing this not because of any commitment to peace, but because it's politically uncomfortable for his base right now but he prepares for massive use of force, uh, the bomb him back to the Stone Age uh, faction. Uh, this is what the nuclear modernization is all about. Uh, he's not hesitant about it at all. He, the Woodward book shows he's brags about it. We have these secret nuclear weapons that we can use uh, that no one else knows about. A Biden administration would not be averse to these kinds of things, but for them it would be a last resort. They don't think that this kind, this complex of policies that Trump is using is a stable way to rule. They realize they're realistic enough to understand that US power is not what it was in the 1950s. The world is not the same as it was in the 1950s. And this translates into some differences around political policies in at least four different areas. First, they've been interested in ramping down tensions in the Middle East rather than ramping them up. That's what the Iran agreement was about. And the Biden people have said they're going to try to go back into the JCPOA, the, the nuclear agreement, if the Biden administration is in power. Second, they're not into usable nuclear weapons. They think that's something that's going to get out of hand and be more destructive of U.S. power than helpful. Third, they don't, they're not in close to every single racist authoritarian on the planet. And they sometimes believe in multilateral action and accepting compromise account the interests of others besides themselves. They don't think the U.S. can just rule the roost all by itself. And last, they believe in science and climate change and pandemics are real and it requires some level of global cooperation in order to address them. Now we can address the specifics of all of these uh, and the other kinds of issues that Cole mentioned when we were in the questions and answers. But uh, I just want to end this section by saying we can't rely on their goodwill or the commitment to these things to enforce them. Uh, in a pinch, uh, their class interests and in global hegemony might trump any single one of these considerations. But they do offer us opportunities to push, to push them to go further and to leverage these to chip away at some of the other areas where they and the Trump administration essentially pursue the same policies. And that brings us to the last point, how do we get some clout? How do we get some clout to shift policies? Uh, the first point I want to make there is the importance of what I call internationalist hubs. There's a, these are organizations, coalitions, publications, and movements that are mainly focused, that have their prime focus on peace, disarmament, or solidarity with people in a particular country or region. Uh, those kinds of formations include groups like Massachusetts Peace Action and Peace Action Nationally, About Face, Code Pink, Mexico. 
Co-Solidarity Project, the various Palestinian organizations, Mayors for Peace, Tricontinental Foreign Policy and Focus, dozens of others. These are the consistent hubs that keep the entire progressive movement and broad layers of the population up to date. They provide analysis and strategy. They map out campaigns. They provide spokespeople, op-ed writers. These are extremely important. But the peace and solidarity groups can only do so much. How much clout the internationalist politics can wield in the United States depends on being able to mobilize and galvanize and sustain more than passive support among those sectors that are usually focused as their main focus on so-called domestic issues. Two entryways into doing that at the current moment. First is working closely with organizations that are focused on key issues of the day around racial justice, economic justice, immigrant rights, and so on, gender justice, backing those issues, building connections, and finding ways to incorporate an internationalist dimension into that work. And one that doesn't just add another item to the long list that's already on every overburdened activist uh, list. So we have, for example, the key demand right now to defund the police coming out of the racial justice movement and the movement for black lives in particular. And those rumblings in relation to, the, to that, people are starting to pick up also on the idea of defunding the military. And that builds on some of the move the money campaigns that have been going on in different cities and localities at various times over the last decade. Uh, there's healthcare, not warfare efforts uh, that tap into all the energy behind the demand for Medicare for all, for universal health coverage, and so on. Uh, there's groups like the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, where no war, no warming is one of their key slogans. Uh, Toby's going to talk in his presentation, I'm sure, about the work of Justice is Global that talks and links it in in terms of the economic struggles of workers all around the world. Uh, United We Dream has just launched a new campaign along with the Institute for Policy Studies working to link immigration, anti-militarism, racist policing, and climate change all together in a package. So one route is to work with and over the long term build connections with those issue based groups fighting on domestic issues. You know, back in the anti Vietnam War days, it was when the National Welfare Rights Organization, Martin Luther King's factions within the civil rights movement, SNCC, involved anti war movement, and it wasn't just organizations who had been built specifically around the peace issue. The other entryway to build more cloud has to do the new layer of progressive and socialist elected officials, all the way from Congress, state legislatures, city councils, and so on. There's a whole surge into the electoral arena of candidates with progressive politics, particularly women of color. And many of them have progressive programs. They all have progressive ideas and are sympathetic to anti-war and anti-militarist politics. Bernie's been a couple here, the squad. Uh, and there's a lot of work that's been done about foreign policy platforms that can bridge what's politically viable, as well as with uh, things that are radical and move uh, the needle forward. Uh, there was a long span ago and in these times about a proposed foreign policy for progressive elected officials. Ilhan Omar has a proposed set of proposals called Peace. And there's a whole range of people in the congressional world and in state legislatures, Cole I said was talking before about lobbying the state legislature in Massachusetts today, who are sympathetic to those things of the national legislative agenda. And what we also have going for ourselves here is that there's a big shift in public opinion within the voting base for Democratic Party politicians. And that's not just true on the so-called easier issues like uh, Saudi Arabia being uh, murderers of journalists and uh, shifting 10%, uh, where we now have at least about half of the uh, 
congressional delegation of Democrats willing to vote for 10% cuts in the military, but especially around, even around it, what have been so-called third rail issues like Palestine. Josh Rubner has a very interesting article a while ago about the collapse of the pyramid and the Democratic Party support uh, for Israel, the blank check for Israel that's happening from the bottom up. None of those pathways, the pathway to building connections with non-electoral movements or with the electoral arena provide quick, easy fixes. They're not as simple as organizing a specific demonstration around a hot button issue. But I think these are the long-term routes to building enough clouds to be able to turn this around step by step and begin to have a real impact and make internationalism a major force within American politics. Uh, thanks, and I'll turn it over to Toby. Great, thanks, Max. A lot to think about there. Okay, Toby, you're up. Great, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here uh, and appreciate having this conversation with all of you. Um, my name is Toby Chow. I'm the director of Justices Global. Um, I want to share some slides uh, to ground us. Uh, although before I get to those, I want to say a bit about um, uh, Justices Global. Uh, so we're a project at People's Action. People's Action is a national organization. Uh, that includes uh, member organizations across the country. Uh, our member organizations are, are uh, in general, uh, organizations that work at the state and local level on issues of uh, racial and economic justice, um, uh, of uh, climate justice, uh, and uh, are also active in progressive and rural politics. Uh, so uh, electing progressives into office and, um, and working with them uh, while they are in office. Uh, Justice is Global uh, is a project that we founded at People's Action uh, just last year uh, in June. Uh, and we have a long-term uh, mission to transform the global economy. Um, and part of our strategic understanding is that uh, this growing US-China conflict, uh, which has accelerated tremendously uh, this year, uh, is a fundamental uh, threat uh, to um, peace and justice uh, globally uh, and the future of everyone on the earth, uh, including uh, people here in the US. Um, so I'll say a bit more about uh, how we're approaching uh, this moment. Um, I want to start uh, by uh, just sort of taking, uh, spending some time looking at uh, how this rise in anti-China politics is playing out uh, in the US this year. Uh, and in particular, how the Trump administration, the Republican Party, and the whole right-wing uh, infrastructure has been pushing it uh, since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. So uh, this is a slide, if you can see, of uh, uh, Mike Pompeo, um, uh, a big speech uh, he made back in July. Uh, some quotes from this speech was all about China and the supposed threat of China. Uh, he cast uh, this in apocalyptic terms. So he says, if we bend the knee now, our children's children may be at the mercy of the Chinese Communist Party. And he said that securing our freedoms from the Chinese Communist Party is the mission of our time. So the way he portrays the threat is that uh, if we do not get much more aggressive and confront China now and uh, put an end to uh, these plans that he is attributing to the Chinese government, uh, then they are going to come for us. They're going to come for the U.S. Um, they're going to subjugate this country uh, and subjugate, you know, our, our children or, or our children's children. Um, so this is a massively inflated uh, sense of the threat that um, uh, China poses to the U.S. Uh, it is um, completely ungrounded in anything that the Chinese government is doing or even talking about doing. But this is uh, the, the rhetoric that we are, are facing, um, uh, particularly from the right, although, as I'll talk a bit more about later, uh, it, it does extend across the political spectrum to an extent. Um, let's see here. Hopefully this will play. 
Uh-oh. This is a clip from an interview with Trump in August. Look, China will own the United States if this election is lost by Donald Trump. If I don't win the election, China will own the United States. You're going to have to learn to speak Chinese. Um, so hopefully that audio came through. I think I set that up correctly. Um, he says, if, if Biden wins, then China. Yeah, it did. It did. Okay, great. Um, so uh, this is one of the main parts of the messaging strategy of the Trump campaign and of the Republican Party in general. Um, a wide range of Republican candidates for office are running on this messaging strategy, uh, claiming that the stakes in this election are um, uh, whether, um, uh, whether or not the United States will sort of remain an autonomous country or, or China will take over. And the idea is that if Biden wins, then that means China is taking over the country. Um, there is uh, sort of an implicit um, racist message uh, here. Uh, so the idea that um, uh, there is a threat of your child having to learn Chinese sort of portrays the Chinese language and, and by extension, uh, Chinese language speakers um, as, as a threat uh, to the nation. Um, and this is a consistent feature of this messaging from the right. So uh, this uh, goes way back to April um, when the Trump campaign and the Republican Party as a whole uh, formu uh, formalized a messaging strategy around the pandemic. Um, uh, and this is in response to uh, the obvious attacks that can be made against Trump and the Republican Party that they have massively failed uh, the country uh, in their handling of the pandemic. Uh, for the Trump campaign and uh, the Republican Party, the response is to shift the blame on to China. They, need, they absolutely need to avoid taking responsibility for their catastrophic mishandling of the pandemic. So their solution is to shift as much of the blame as possible uh, on to China. Um, so uh, they have a three-part messaging strategy. Um, first is that China is to blame for the pandemic um, and a host of other things as well. Um, uh, unemployment in the Rust Belt, um, the opioid crisis, there's a whole range of things that they want to blame on China. Uh, second part of the messaging strategy is to say that the Democrats um, are either, they, they have either capitulated to China or perhaps they are actively collaborating with the Chinese government to undermine uh, the United States. Uh, and then third, uh, promising that uh, as re the Republican Party is going to be the savior of the U.S. and that the Republicans are the ones who are going to stand up uh, to China and, and confront China. Um, so uh, this is both building upon and feeding into this massive rise in anti-China sentiment uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so this is uh, a graph of polling from the Pew Research Center. Unfavorable views of China reach new heights. Um, and uh, we are now at uh, almost three quarters of the country has unfavorable views of China. It's, it's risen massively uh, in this time. Um, so uh, for the Republicans and the Trump campaign, this is both an opportunity to move this anti-China messaging strategy and to mobilize this anti-China sentiment uh, against the Democrats. Um, and at the same time, they are actively feeding in to this rise in anti-China sentiment. So they're both um, making use of this rise in anti-China sentiment while doing what, whatever they can to um, exacerbate it as much as possible. Um, and uh, it's also important to note that there's an inextricable link between the rise in anti-China anti-China sentiment, and what we've also seen, which is a rise in anti-Chinese racism, uh, which has also extended uh, broadly to um, anti-Asian racism, um, uh, targeting people from a, a wide range of Asian nationalities. Um, uh, this is because uh, the, the standard form that anti Chinese racism and I think more generally anti-Asian racism takes uh, 
there's it, it it makes it very difficult for people to make a distinction between China and any individual Chinese people because there is this image of um, China is this homogenous monolithic whole that has no real individuals in it. Um, so for if you've seen Star Trek, uh, I think uh, uh, an analogy would be the Borg. Um, Chinese people are seen as this Borg-like collective, um, which means uh, any, any animosity against China is very easily transferred to individual Chinese people. So these two things uh, tend to go together. Um, and, and let me stop sharing there. So, um, why is this happening? Um, so in part, this is sort of a cynical election strategy. Um, part of this is that uh, the Republican Party sees anti-China messaging as useful for the purposes of winning the November election. Um, but I think it's important to understand that this has much deeper roots um, and that anti-China nationalism uh, is deeply rooted in uh, uh, long-term trends within the US ruling class and has been building uh, for some time now. Uh, it's been building throughout the Trump administration, um, but it goes back further than that. Uh, we saw it uh, growing also under the Obama administration, um, which had the strategy of, a, of, of, a, of the pivot to Asia, which was all about containing China with both uh, national security policy as well as trade policy. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, was part of the Obama administration's anti-China policy. It was the idea that they would create a US-led trade economic block uh, that would be a counterweight to China's growing uh, economic influence in the region. Um, and uh, I think, um, and there are earlier uh, predecessors as well. Uh, under the George W. Bush administration, very early on in, in 2001, uh, there was a move towards a greater focus on countering uh, China, which then got derailed by 9-11 and replaced with the war on terror. But prior to that, there was a, an emerging emphasis on um, countering uh, the influence of China. Um, so why is this happening? We're seeing this rise in anti-China nationalism. Um, uh, it is being led most visibly uh, by Trump and the right. Um, but we also see uh, um, a lot of figures in the Democratic Party and uh, liberal institutions, liberal media uh, feeding into it as well. Um, uh, normally in less sort of virulently racist and um, conspiratorial forms, but uh, this is a thing that spans the political spectrum. Um, so this has deep roots uh, in um, uh, a few different factions within the ruling class that um, I'd like to mention. So one is uh, the national security establishment, um, the militarists in the US ruling class, uh, and this does span the political spectrum. Um, their concern is that a rising China is a threat to the US military's ability to uh, have total global hegemony, to maintain military control over the entire planet. Um, and uh, they see correctly that uh, a rising China threatens their ability to maintain this like total global military hegemony. Um, uh, there's also uh, a powerful strain of economic nationalism uh, within the ruling class. And there's a, a um, the, the idea here is that uh, the Chinese economy is a threat to the US economy and the US economy must be defended against this Chinese threat. Um, Sometimes this takes the form of uh, saying that we need to protect manufacturing jobs and, and blue collar jobs. And this is a very politically potent message. But I think within the ranks of the ruling class, uh, a much more uh, significant and powerful strain of economic nationalism is the concern that uh, there are Chinese firms that have emerged as rivals to US firms. Um, and we see this in particular in the tech sector, um, the concern that the Chinese tech sector is now rivaling or in, in some cases, maybe even surpassing um, uh, US tech companies. Um, 
So uh, there, the idea is like protecting the profits and, and the power of these like important sectors of, um, of uh, US capitalism. Uh, and I think finally, uh, an important strain, another important source of this to mention is the way that um, US global hegemony um, functions as a form of uh, global white supremacy. And I think the fact that uh, China is, um, you know, a non-white country is uh, an important part of the perception of uh, a threat of uh, rising China. It's not just that the, the US, uh, that US global hegemony is threatened, but that um, sort of white control of the planet is, is being threatened. Um, let's see here. Okay. I need to wrap up here. So um, this is uh, resulting in a number of very dangerous trends that we've seen. Um, first is uh, an increase in anti-China rhetoric and discourse. We see this in campaign messaging, in particular, again, from the Republicans, although there are uh, some hints of this in the Democratic Party as well. It's less bad overall within the Democratic Democratic Party, but we do see anti-China messages from the Democrats as well. Um, there's also a rise in uh, anti-China uh, media coverage. Again, this is worst. This is the worst in uh, right-wing media, but we also see uh, a lot of this in uh, sort of mainstream liberal media. Um, we see a series of uh, anti-China policies, um, and this is about more than foreign policy. It spans all policy areas. Uh, so we do see anti-China foreign policy. So for example, uh, the US military buildup in the South China Sea, um, which is uh, uh, extreme, become an extremely risky part of the world right now in terms of a potential flare up of, um, of military violence between the US and China. Um, uh, we see it in trade policy. Uh, so the US-China trade war, which Trump launched in 2018 and that threatens to flare up once again. Uh, we see it in policies around the tech industry, the attacks on uh, Chinese uh, tech companies uh, like Huawei, uh, now um, WeChat and TikTok. Uh, we also see it in immigration policies. We're seeing policies targeting, uh, uh, in particular, Chinese international students um, right now, uh, either barring them from the country or um, uh, recently, I think last week, a, a thousand Chinese international students who had already acquired their visas, had their visas summarily revoked. Um, and we now uh, have reports of Chinese international students being uh, stopped and, and searched at airports and um, being forced to uh, allow uh, immigration officials to go through their uh, mobile devices and their social media accounts and so on. Um, and then finally, there is oh, <laughs> there's a rise in um, uh, anti-China sentiment, uh, again, that we saw before, and this includes uh, a rise in anti-Chinese racism. Um, so, um, last thing I wanna say is that this is a very dire situation. This threatens world peace. Uh, it threatens our ability to deal with this pandemic as a united global community. Uh, it threatens our ability to uh, counter um, global climate change. Um, it threatens our ability to uh, deal with global poverty. There's a range of threats here. Um, there are, however, a series of opportunities that I see. Um, one is that the rise in anti-China sentiment is um, in, 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 in our work at Justice is Global, we found that it's very broad, but it's also quite shallow. And that um, if we uh, can exercise the right narrative tools from the progressive side, um, it is possible uh, to uh, prevent counter, uh, present counter narratives to people that can move them off of this anti-China sentiment. Um, Second is that uh, there is a strong desire for real solutions to this pandemic. And um, if we can make clear enough the need for US-China cooperation to beat the pandemic, that can be a powerful counter to anti-China sentiment. Um, and another important piece of the puzzle, I think, is that um, this country remains very tired of war. And we are on a, on a path that is taking us closer and closer towards military confrontation with China, which is extremely dangerous, but the closer that we get to that 
point, uh, the, the greater the threat of a loss of popular legitimacy becomes. Um, uh, even with the rise in anti-China sentiment, people are not ready to translate that into any kind of military confrontation uh, with China. Um, so uh, uh, that is, um, that is an, or an organizing opportunity for us. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, I want to finish by saying a couple of things about the approach at Justice is Global. Um, uh, one piece of our work is that uh, just this last weekend, we launched a campaign for global cooperation to end the pandemic. Uh, we have a, a platform of uh, some key ways that the US government needs to cooperate with other countries to create real solutions to the pandemic, um, including, uh, importantly, with China. Um, uh, and uh, another big piece of our work is developing strategy uh, to counter anti-China nationalism. A couple of big pieces of this work around developing strategy is building movement infrastructure um, uh, across organizations. So we're working with a broad uh, range of organizations in uh, very different sectors um, to uh, develop like a shared strategic orientation about um, uh, the threat of uh, this US-China Cold War and what we need to do uh, to counter it. Um, we've also been developing a narrative strategy and figuring out um, what are the most powerful ways that we can counter this anti-China politics at the level of narrative, um, at the level of public discourse and the messaging that people are receiving. Um, and uh, uh, this has led to a uh, report on, uh, on some work that we did over the summer that I can um, share in the chat for those who can see the chat. Um, so uh, I'll, yeah, I'll share a couple of links uh, uh, that people can check out, but uh, let's stop there and move to questions. Great, thank you, Toby. That was extremely helpful, uh, enlightening. Um, let's go ahead to questions and discussion. Um, you can either pose your question by writing in the chat, or you can go to the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom window and click where it says raise hand, and a little blue hand will appear in the little Zoom box, and we'll know that you're trying to speak, and we'll call on you. Uh, let me go to Michael Eisinger first. He has both a comment and a question. Michael, why don't you un unmute yourself? Okay, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Good. Uh, the observation I had is something I've been writing and talking about for a while, and that is that uh, there's a confluence of struggles. The anti-militarism, anti-war, and, and peace struggle is also economic and social justice struggle, a racial justice struggle. It's an environmental and a, a just transition labor struggle. And we've got to break down the silos that divide these different movements because I, I operate under the uh, premise that none of us can win if we don't all win. And none of us can win without the collaboration, solidarity, and uh, cooperation of, of the other elements of a progressive movement. Well, that's my observation. And I will put a uh, link in the chat to an article I've written about that. Uh, my question is, is um, China holds a considerable portion of US international debt. What role does that play in the attitude of various sections of capital and the political elites? And what are its implications for US foreign policy? Uh, Toby or Max, want to tackle that? Um, sure, I can, I can address that. So uh, that is, uh, so one of the talking points around the supposed China threat is the amount of US debt that they hold. Um, but I think this is uh, not really well grounded in economic reality. Uh, the Chinese hold, the amount of US debt that China holds is um, fundamental to uh, this very deep integration between the Chinese and US economies. Um, so, uh, um, Let's see. Uh, 
long story short, um, this is not any kind of threat that China can wield against the U.S. except at uh, it, it. Any attempt that China makes to use this as a threat against the U.S. would also be at the same time an existential threat to the Chinese economy. So there is the potential that China could use uh, its holdings of U.S. debt to um, attack the U.S. economy, but that would at the same time uh, cause an explosion within the Chinese economy uh, as well. So that's a thing that could happen, but it would be at the tail end of a deterioration in the U.S.-China conflict where, um, you know, the, the conflict would have had to escalate it to a tremendous point uh, before for, in order for that to happen. Um, so it's not really any kind of leverage that China can, can use against the U.S. because it also destroys China. Great, thanks. Uh, let me go to Jackie and Jonathan King. Uh, thanks for those excellent presentations. Um, I just want to call, I'm a co-chair of the Mass Peace Action Board. I want to call attention to two points. One, with respect to nuclear weapons, uh, we shouldn't just view this as, uh, you know, foreign policy interactions with Russia and China. The business plan, this is one of the most profitable sectors of the military industrial complex. The nuclear weapons build up the 1.7 trillion proposed uh, continuing upgrade is the business plan of that sector of the defense industry. They need to be have made more nuclear weapons to make these guaranteed profits. For that, they need some kind of big enemy, uh, China, Russia, Iran, um, and North Korea. It can rotate. Every year they can change it. They don't care. It's not really about threatening Russia. It's about making sure the American people will continue to pay enormous amount of tax dollars into their coffers. And it, it, this is continuously lost sight of, that, that the industry that makes these weapons is a major player uh, in trying to destabilize the world situation. And, uh, you know, drug lords, uh, you can't justify nuclear submarines against drug lords or terrorists. They need some big power to justify it. So we're always going to see uh, the claim that some uh, nuclear armed nation is an enemy because they need that. Second point I want to make is um, um, Max mentioned many organizations, but the single broadest organization in the United States that has the position opposing militarism in the war economy is the Poor People's Campaign, right, which reaches out and represents the bottom sector of the working class. We don't call those people working class. They weren't in the machinist union, but they're the people that the economy sits on. So uh, that's an extremely important formation since they already have the position of opposing the war economy, calling for 300 billion cuts opposing militarism. Most of the other groups we work with do not have that position. Uh, and as Max has laid out, we, we have to find ways to bring it to them like fund healthcare and our warfare. Anyway, thanks, thanks a lot for the time. Okay, Max or Toby, you wanna to tackle any of that? either the role of the military industrial complex in driving policy or on the poor people's campaign? Uh, well, I think he's right about the poor people's campaign. It's a very important formation. Um, the, uh, right now, their stronger point is on messaging than on uh, the organizing side. So we need to try to bolster the organizing side and bring together some of the uh, organizing groups that have a, a, a little more on the ground uh, structures into that tent. So I think he's absolutely right about that. I'm sorry, I forgot your name, um, but I think that's uh, exactly right. Jonathan. Absolutely right about the military industrial complex. I mean, it, you know, it was hilarious the other day that uh, Trump accused the generals of being, uh, wanting just to uh, go to wars. Uh, you know, the ironic thing is, Right now, the U.S. military is risk averse. Uh, they, 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 they fought a lot of wars. They haven't won one in a hell of a long time, and they don't want to. Uh, they don't want to lose another one. They want a clear objective. And uh, Trump appointed the the Raytheon executive as Secretary of Defense. 
uh, you know, so they're just absolutely going crazy at the trough and uh, defunding the military uh, and starting to cut into that is absolutely crucial. So I think. Thank you. Yeah, if I can add to that, I think um, I think the profit motive uh, in the military industrial complex does play a crucial role here. At the same time, I don't want to understate um, the degree to which national security elites, they, they really are true believers in the threat of China. So it's not just an excuse to fund the military, although that does, there are definitely actors who are, who, for whom that is a significant motivation. Um, but there is like a real ideological commitment uh, in a lot of the national security uh, establishment. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think that at this point, China, the threat of China really has emerged is the main argument for increased military spending. Um, and I know that Trump used that, invoked that explicitly is, uh, as an attack on progressive forces uh, arguing for reduced, uh, mil um, a reduced military budget. It was like, okay, so you are doing that. And in fact, I think he, he accused those progressive forces, so like us, <laughs> of uh, doing the work of the Chinese Communist Party for them. So implying that there's actually conspiracy there, which is very common in this anti-China rhetoric, this sort of conspiracy theory stuff. Um, uh, and one, one last concern I have around this is um, um, there are some parts of the right who are increasingly talking up the idea of the defense industry as a job creation, a job create, a source of job creation. And, you know, we're, we're heading into a very deep economic crisis. And I worry that there is some potential for a form of like military Keynesianism where military spending becomes like the job creation uh, uh, strategy. Um, and that that is that there is some potential for that to sort of gain more energy on the right, at least. Absolutely, absolutely, and a growing danger. Okay, next up, Duncan McFarland. Okay, Hi, thank, thanks for the presentations. Um, I just wanted to comment that I think this is the anti-China campaign, potentially a long-term strategy, um, in addition to the other uh, reasons. Um, if, if I'm a strategist for US imperialist hegemony, like, let's say like Pompeo, um, the idea that the Chinese Communist Party is gonna take over the United States is, is ridiculous. But the idea that China is building another very powerful pole globally, economically, politically, and possibly even militarily, it's happening. And China's official are articulated policy is they want a multipolar world and they explicitly state they oppose hegemony. Now, regardless of exactly what you think about that, um, you know, this is being implemented in terms of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it's now larger than NATO, an Asian security organization. The Belt and Road is the world's biggest uh, infrastructure, international infrastructure project. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which was started by China, um, I believe is, is more or less as big as the World Bank at this point. So if you want hegemony, it, it's actually a correct observation that China is posing a growing challenge. So, uh, you know, this could well be a very long term um, struggle. I think it, I think that progressives and socialists and leftists should all unite to oppose any kind of new Cold War on China um, because of the huge possible disastrous consequences. Now, however, within the ruling class, there are also, um, there are also factions that oppose this policy. Um, and, and some of them do connect with the Democratic Party. Um, you know, the progressive wing doesn't like war intervention. Um, uh, um, Asian American and I think people of color that connect to the uh, Democratic Party don't like the, uh, the racist aspect. 
Um, and there are also major U.S. corporate interests, huge U.S. corporate interests in China that don't want to see their profits threatened. So, um, so I just want to, you know, I want to thank uh, Massachusetts Peace Action for for hosting this this webinar because I, I think this is an issue that could well be with the peace movement for a long time. Uh, thank you. Okay, Toby Max, any comment? Yeah, I think I think the point about um, the the divisions within the Democratic Party, both at the popular and elite level, are like very important. Like that is that is absolutely uh, those are all opportunities for us uh, to um, uh, uh, organize uh, a counterforce uh, to um, this growing uh, anti-China politics. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I, I definitely agree that, yeah, it is a fact that China is a threat to um, US hegemony. And, um, uh, you know, definitely one factor in the growth of um, anti-China nationalism under the pandemic is the degree to which uh, the, <laughs> the, the global popular legitimacy of the United States has just dropped like a uh, rock. Um, just sort of the, the idea of US leadership is, is absolutely in tatters. Um, and that, that is part of what the U.S. ruling class is, is reacting to. Um, I, I think like um, uh, the, 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 yeah, and, 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 but then the, 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 the slide is from seeing, accurately seeing China as a threat to U.S. hegemony to um, seeing China is like in various ways trying to take us over um, this is sort of, um, it, it is, it is like unimaginable how easily people make that slide from that, from the one thing to the other. Right. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Toby. Uh, next up is Helen Raisin with a question. Helen? Right. I had to unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes, um, we can hear you. So. Uh, could you um, either or, or both of you talk specifically about what you see as the way forward for the Palestinian struggle for liberation? Uh, well, I think the Palestinians are going to have a very hard time. And the dominant thinking, as I understand it, among the uh, left wing within the Palestinian movement is that the uh, struggle for two states uh, has reached an end and that there has to be a gradual shift or an abrupt shift uh, toward an anti-apartheid struggle uh, for equality within a single state. Uh, on the idea that the single state already exists. Uh, that's going to be a very difficult transition to make because of some of the investment that the uh, current leadership of the Palestinian Authority has. Uh, the idea has been around for a long time, but it's been picking up steam uh, in the Palestinian population. Uh, and uh, it's going to be an extremely difficult struggle also because uh, the Israeli power uh, and ruthlessness is so great. Uh, there is a shift in U.S. policy, in, in U.S. public opinion, increasingly in solidarity or respect for Palestinian rights, which is important. Uh, and it's probably right now in terms of a single region or part of the world or struggle uh, akin to the national liberation struggles of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It's the most dynamic uh, popular movement within the U.S. Uh, and Black Palestinian solidarity has reached uh, a very high level and probably will grow. Uh, but uh, that shift is being compensated by the fact that the Israel lobby in the United States 
has essentially shifted its main base from the American Jewish community to the Christian right. Uh, so Christian Zion, I mean, Trump has pretty much said so. He says, hey, the evangelicals are more excited about moving the embassy to Jerusalem than the Jews are. Uh, and that's a pretty conscious decision on their part. Um, so you're going to see complicated dynamics in the United States. But it's going to be a long and difficult struggle for the Palestinians. Uh, the politics of the Palestinian left in the 70s and 80s was that the Palestinian struggles gains depended on regional gains was part of the Arab Revolution and required changes in the regional balance. And that's going to be extremely difficult as well, given the victory of the counter-revolution against the Arab Spring. So this is one of the most difficult struggles on the planet right now. And uh, we have to dig in for a long haul. Yeah, uh, one, one thing that I'd like to add to that is that uh, the US-China conflict is, it, this is the core global rivalry that is um, threatening to like suck in all the rest of the world with it. And increasingly countries are being, are, are being pressured or feeling pressure to choose one side or the other. Um, and this is already playing out in Israel-Palestine. Uh, Israel, of course, is aligned with the US, um, in particular with the Trump administration. Um, pa the, the Palestinian Authority in response has, has taken, I forget what they did, there, there was some, uh, some action they took that suggested that they were sort of uh, seeking closer ties with China. Uh, Iran and China also are um, uh, closely aligned. Um, we could see something similar happening between India and Pakistan. India has sided with the US against China, uh, which over time could create uh, pressure for Pakistan to side with China against India and the US. So what we can see, and this is going to play out in different ways in different parts of the world, but we could see like the emergence of these like competing blocks of countries where there's like tension all the way down. So there's tension between the US and China, then there's Israel versus Palestine and Iran, there's India versus Pakistan. And this creates overall just an incredibly volatile global situation um, where like each source of tension can add into every other source of tension. So if something flares up between Israel and Iran or between the US and Iran, then China could see that as a threat and then things could spiral out from there. Or there's a lot of different ways this could play out. So I think um, this is something that's going to make the quest for peace and justice in a lot of parts of the world that much more challenging as this US-China rivalry sort of sucks the, all these other parts of the world into it. Thanks. Thanks, Max and Tom. Very interesting. Um, next up is Christine Ahn with a question. Hi, Cole. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much um, to Max and Toby for an excellent um, webinar today. I just, um, I wanted to say one thing really quickly. There was a new study that just came out called Diplomacy and Restraint, the World View of American Voters. It was by the Eurasia Group, who I've never heard before. But um, they say that more Americans want to decrease defense funding to redirect it domestically. 56% of Americans want to increase um, uh, diplomatic engagement with the world, including with adversaries, to avoid military confrontation. So I, that seems to me like really aligned with where we're going. But I guess the two questions I had um, were kind of similar ones that I feel like we struggle with on the Korea peace issue vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea is like, what kind of engagement is even possible with um, civil society groups in China? And, um, and especially in this moment of a pandemic. And the second is um, what kinds of cleavages are there in the elite class, given how interconnected the economy is? And I mean, I know that that's the work of the, you know, working class struggles to challenge that, but at the same time, like to avoid complete um, going to war with China, like, are there cleavages in the elite between the business and the, you know, military industrial complex? Those are my questions. Thanks for taking my question. Thanks, Christine. Uh, Toby, you want to tackle that or Max? Uh, sure. Um, so I think 
Um, so the, the task of building grassroots solidarity, um, like that is the work that, uh, that I would really like to be doing. Um, it is, however, extremely difficult right now. So the increasing nationalism in the US, uh, which is also mirrored by increasing nationalism uh, and crackdowns in, in China makes this uh, exceedingly difficult. Um, uh, there, there are some, uh, there are some places where we can still have like conversations, like open conversations, but increasingly like talking to uh, grassroots activists in uh, mainland China and then now uh, also in Hong Kong uh, is uh, difficult and can actually put our counterparts over there uh, in danger. Um, so th there is a big, a big question, uh, strategic question right now of like, how then can we build transnational solidarity? Uh, I think a, a, a big shift that some people are moving, that, that some, some people are making and uh, that we're engaging in as well is looking at the diaspora as a place to build a, a form of transnational uh, solidarity. Um, so for example, uh, there's hundreds of thousands of Chinese international students in the United States. Um, uh, can we uh, organize solidarity um, uh, with them? Because that is, even though they're physically within the United States, that is a form of transnationalism. Um, uh, but it is, it is absolutely very difficult. Um, uh, the cleavages in the elite, uh, I think that is absolutely something we need to take into account uh, strategically. Uh, so for example, in, in the US financial and tech sectors, uh, there are still very strong interests in sustaining U.S.-China economic cooperation. Um, and uh, I think we need to take seriously uh, what opportunities there are for us there. Um, uh, it's, it's definitely not my uh, uh, favorite practice to um, think about how to make common cause with corporate interests. Um, but I think we need to uh, think about like what, what, are there any opportunities strategically for us there? Uh, and I think that, uh, that there are. Um, I think it's also important to see, uh, to, know that, uh, to note though that um, th there's sort of uh, one, one narrative that I see out there in some sectors of the left is that corporate America is entirely wedded to the US-China economic relationship, which is, which is not true. Um, part of the growth in anti-China nationalism uh, within the past decade has been an, inc an a growth in the number of U.S. corporate sectors that now see their counterparts in, in China as threats rather than as like uh, 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 firms that they can cooperate with in order to maximize their own profit and power. So um, that shift within corporate America is a huge part of the, the rise in anti-China nationalism, but there are still uh, a, a lot of sectors within corporate America that want to sustain the relationship. And um, we need to think about um, uh, uh, how, how that can be advantageous to us. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay. okay, oh, go ahead, Max. Let me take a couple cracks at this. Um, thanks, Christine. Well, it was great to see you. Um, first of all, we have public opinion on our side on a whole range of the issues that have been discussed tonight. Uh, and where we don't, the way, as Tobita said, the anti-China sentiment is broad, but it's not that deep. The problem is how to politically focus that and turn it into a powerful political force, especially in terms of foreign policy, which is the least accessible, uh, even in terms of congressional oversight. So it's been moved into the executive branch and the national security state so tightly. Uh, so this is this is a challenge in the foreign in in dealing with as Michael said all these interconnected issues. There's breakthroughs more possible on certain ones than others, and this is really challenging. But we shouldn't forget that we do have public opinion on our side and can win public opinion where we don't. This is the source of uh, confidence that we can actually move forward. Uh, second point. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about the U.S.-China situation as a World War I type scenario. 
where against uh, people's better judgment, the world blundered into war where there was rivalry between different great powers. And the thing that's changed since then is the interconnectedness of the economy. Uh, and that means that there are some checks, there are some difficulties. I think what Toby said about the banking, uh, the, the debt is right on the mark. Uh, before you got to that point, the disentanglement of the different economies where, it could, where one could go to war uh, has to proceed quite a pace. Uh, there's a certain inertia to it. Even, even we can't rely on the corporate class, but there's a certain inertia to the actual military action because of the interconnection between the economies. This is one of the things that's so especially dangerous about the Trump administration because the Trump administration and ones that would follow in that model, they're into autarky. They wanna disconnect the US economy from the rest of the world. That's not the point of view of almost any faction within the Democratic Party. They wanna maintain US global hegemony, but they believe in a multilateral situation uh, and, um, and the US would interpenetrate with other economies. That's how the US has made a lot of money over the last decades. Um, but the Trump administration has a whole different direction. And if the country goes in that direction, it dramatically increases the danger of confrontation and war. Uh, so that's the second point. The third point I wanna make is that often in politics, you don't win certain fights directly. You have to find out what wedge, where you can win something that then starts to have an effect. So for example, look at how the Republican party has moved into climate change denialism. 30 years ago, the views on environmental issues were roughly even between the Democrats and the Republicans. There was very little difference in public opinion within uh, the two parties. But as the Republican party became more and more racist and a sort of uh, our side, us versus them, which was primarily around issues of race and racism and white supremacy, climate change got linked into the thing as a litmus test. So if you're on that team, you have to believe in climate change. It didn't come about because there was a debate on climate change and all kinds of people in the Republican party turned, changed their opinion. So we have to figure out what can leverage a reduction of tensions because we need a reduction of tensions globally. And that's the climate that's the most favorable for us in moving peace and solidarity and reopening things. Uh, Toby's writing on the mark again. It's, mm -hmm. as, as the United States ramps up its aggression against China, China cracks down. And, and that's, that's what happens in a tense situation. Both sides feel threatened. Uh, and our best leverage for, for ramping that down is making some global cooperation around climate change which is increasingly recognized by more and more countries of the world as this huge problem. And if we can get some global cooperation going on climate change, that can begin to change public opinion and also change the dynamic between the different countries. If they can cooperate on one thing that's actually of benefit to their populations, then they can cooperate on others. So we have to start a different cycle going, figure out what is the place that can start that cycle and then spill over into the other areas that are more difficult. Uh, we certainly have to challenge the Cold War narrative head on about China, but it's gonna be difficult given the uh, incredible um, power of the military industrial complex and the narrative and the whole United States national chauvinism, which has been inculcated for 400 years. So we need to find those kinds of uh, vulnerable points. So I'll stop there. Okay, great. Uh, next up is Joseph Gerson. Joseph? Thank you, Cole. And uh, thank you, Toby and Max. Uh, the points I wanna make, uh, in a sense, sort of elaborate on, on, on points that you've, you've made. Um, first of all, just you know, to, to underline you know, that the U.S. national security strategy at this point you know, has pivoted from a priority on the Middle East uh, to the Asia Pacific. And whereas the Strait of Hormuz used to be the geopolitical center of the struggle for world power, uh, it's now the Strait of Malacca uh, through which the oil that fuels the East Asian economies flows. And that's the choke point 
uh, that has the, the Chinese most, mo most worried. Uh, and to, I think it was uh, Duncan was talking about this being a long struggle. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, we, we've moved into a period uh, where, you know, for example, Graham Allison is talking about the Thucydides trap and the fundamental struggle between uh, rising and declining powers. Um, I want to suggest that, that our work needs to proceed essentially in, uh, on, on two legs, not unlike what, what Max was just saying. On the one hand, we have to be resisting uh, the preparations for war, the military confrontation, uh, rolling back the confrontation, South China Sea, uh, Taiwan, uh, East China Sea. And to be aware that um, you know, with the freedom of navigation uh, uh, actions and, and others, it's all too easy to have an incident uh, that could escalate. Uh, people will remember that back in 2001, uh, a U.S. spy plane took down a Chinese plane, uh, and we were on the edge of a very, very serious confrontation when 9-11 happened, uh, and then, then both sides backed off in the face of 9-11. Of uh, so I think we need to be educating our base uh, about the dangers in, in, in these areas. I think we need to be uh, concerned uh, that Trump could pull off an incident um, between now and November 3rd uh, as a way to reinforce uh, his election. Uh, but at the same time that we're working to um, uh, confront, to roll back the, the military threats, uh, I think we might also take a, a page from the uh, model of common security uh, back in the, uh, the U.S. Uh, Soviet Cold War. Uh, the, uh, I think Toby was talking about building positive narratives that, that we can use to build popular support. So as, as uh, several people here have, have said, um, obviously find, well, finding areas where there's, a, where, where there's a possible collaboration that serves the interests of the U.S. people. Uh, I think we need to highlight that as we build an alternative. Uh, obviously uh, climate is there, a uh, pandemic is there, uh, looking at economic development and economic justice. Um, so I think we need to, to, to begin moving in that direction. Just one final piece is in terms of nationalism, just to come back here, in terms of, of an incident that, um, that could take place uh, basically anywhere in the Asia Pacific region at this point, to understand that while we do have the um, deep economic integration, uh, there are also powerful nationalist forces, both in the United States and China. Uh, and and it's, it's not inconceivable uh, that these forces could push leaders uh, to a point into actions uh, that they may not really want to take, uh, but would be disastrous for all of us. Uh, and so I think we, we need to understand just the danger of, of, of those forces. Hey, one more, just one, just one, one last thing. Just I was involved in a, in a um, a meeting actually in, in, in Berlin with the Asia Europe uh, Peace, uh, NGO Peace Forum. And uh, people from India, uh, uh, Philippines, Japan, acro across the region, Korea. Uh, and it was interesting, the uh, we were Europeans there as well, obviously. And while common security, uh, you know, we expected the Europeans to kind of resonate well with, with the idea of common security at this point. We were surprised with the degree to which the Asia Pacific participants found it in their interest and, and found it a model uh, worth building on. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, Max, Toby, any comment? Uh, amen. <laughs> yeah, I uh, agree with all of that. I think if um, if, if we had anything like uh, <laughs> rational leadership uh, in, in the US and, and elsewhere, what would be happening right now is um, uh, an intense focus on building new systems of global cooperation uh, to meet the challenges of this pandemic, and then um, using that as a foundation to uh, also counter these other huge challenges like climate change and, and global poverty. and um, there is like that's that is that's um, that's what we would like to see happen. So we want to we want to build that pathway. Um, uh, th the, the flip side, though, is that um, you know the the rise of nationalism in the face of uh, the pandemic um, is is thereby also a threat to our ability to meet these these other challenges, including climate change. 
Um, so yeah, the stakes are, are, are um, uh, uh, yeah, very high there. Um, I, think, I think the idea of, of building a, uh, an alternative like security architecture is um, challenging. And, I, and, I, and I, my, my sense is that we need to do a lot more uh, thinking about this. Like what is, what is the situation that we want to exist in the South China Sea? We know that, what, that the current trend is disastrous. So um, what is our proposal for what should be happening uh, instead? I think um, that is uh, a question we need to spend a lot more time thinking about um, uh, because I, you know, I think that our movements here in the U.S. are on the path to winning governing power, and we're going to have to start to be able to put forward these proposals about like not just opposing bad things that are happening with the U.S. military, but like what are what are our positive solutions for like very real national security dilemmas and the South China Sea, Taiwan, like those, those are all a part of it. Great, thank you. <clears throat> So per perhaps our last question will come from Des Khan. He is with Pacham and Terrace in uh, Delaware. Des? Oh, thanks. Uh, well, I really appreciate this has been fascinating. Um, and I, I share the concern about China and US hostility toward it. Uh, I don't think that Trump necessarily has a monopoly uh, the Obama administration and uh, Joe Biden himself uh, have also have also like uh, acted in those ways. And Biden has made a number of statements, including during the debates about how, you know, China or Russia, they're all authoritarians. You know, remember he said to Bernie Sanders, come on, Bernie, they're all authoritarians. Like we're, we're against all, it's just very hostile. So, but, what has been concerning me recently is the uh, the campaign against Russia and the fact that the corporate media, as well as PBS and NPR, have got this ongoing sort of parroting of anything the intelligence uh, community, as they call them, have come out with about Russia like threatening our elections and so forth. They just parrot this stuff. And there's the, the problem is it doesn't hold up, you know, investigative journalists like uh, Gareth Porter, who was Mass Peace sponsored the other week, uh, uh, Aaron Maté of the Gray Zone, and also Consortium News and the veteran intelligence professionals for Sanity. They, poked holes in virtually all of that narrative, it just doesn't hold up. And yet, you know, you any newspaper from New York Times on down, uh, NPR, PBS, they're all talking about how Russia is trying to disrupt our elections. And um, even though there are very good uh, analyses that basically destroy these claims, the word is not getting out to most people. You know, you have to go on one of these websites. We can't seem to get that story out. We can't counter that. It's, it's a monolithic parroting campaign. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any ideas about how to get through to people with the alternative viewpoint, but that's a real concern to me. I don't know if anybody has any comment. Okay, the, the Russia bashing. Max, Toby? Uh, well, I don't think that taking that on is quite the way, uh, is the right angle into that one. Uh, the reason, the main reason for Russia-US tensions is that the United States broke uh, its promises not to send, send, uh, send NATO up to Russia's borders back about 10 or 15 years ago. And that created a cycle of hostility where the Russians felt threatened for obvious reasons, given uh, the history of US aggression. And this is the root of the current bad relations between the US and Russia. But the way things have unfolded since then, uh, you know, we're not dealing with the Soviet Union anymore. We're dealing with another oligarch 
uh, in the Putin regime. And the, the Trump people uh, want to ally with Putin. Uh, because Putin has become a hero of the global right in terms of saving white Christian civilization. There's all kinds of linkages between the right-wing groups that Trump is courting and the ones that Putin are courting. So whether or not one believes that Putin has something on Trump or that Trump is, uh, you know, enmeshed with Russian oligarchs, which is not a completely off-the-wall hypothesis given the links between the U.S. parasitic real estate industry and Russian mafia money, even if you left that aside, the alliance between Trump and Putin uh, is part of a global move on the right. Uh, now, the response to that can't be, let's go back to a Cold War policy against Russia, uh, uh, because we're responsible for these problems in the first place. So we have to de-escalate tensions. Uh, but, and, and, you know, the fact that there are Democratic Party leaders and so on who want to make Russia the main uh, critique of Trump as opposed to his racism, white supremacy, uh, war making, anti-immigrant, we have to criticize that too. Uh, but I, I, I guess I just don't agree with the speaker. I, I think it's pretty, uh, I think there's a lot of credibility to the idea that Trump and Putin want to help each other. Uh, and I don't think denying that is uh, the way to make progress in reducing U.S.-Russia tensions uh, and moving things forward in terms of uh, global cooperation with Russia and China and uh, ending these Cold Wars in general. Okay. Uh, Toby, do you want to comment on that or let it go? Um, I mean, I think I broadly agree with, with Max's take. I think my, um, you know, I, I do want to be critical about some of the narratives um, around Russia that we get from uh, Democrats and some parts of the, the liberal media. And um, like it is, it is a form of, 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 of almost like national scapegoating, uh, trying to take all of these enormous failures within U.S. politics and like project them as like the, the, the work of this like um, foreign agent. Um, and that's not the case. Trump is a homegrown problem here in the U.S. Um, uh, I think like we need overall um, uh, a very different uh, understanding of the phenomenon of authoritarianism in general, like we, we are seeing a rise in authoritarianism and cooperation between authoritarian governments and, and then leaders with authoritarian tendencies. Um, uh, and uh, we need to resist the, the impulse to sort of blame that or one country or another. This is, this is a global phenomenon. It is a global trend and it is a pro product of increasing uh, dysfunctions within the existing global system. It is the failures of the sort of neoliberal status quo falling into increasing disarray that is producing these pathologies around the world. So we need to have like a global systemic understanding of this phenomenon and not look for like, oh, it's this country or that country, um, but that it's happening in various countries and that these are all linked. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I think we're gonna have to leave it there. Uh, we've gone up till 8.30. Um, I want to thank our panelists, Max and Toby, for some extremely provocative views. And I also want to thank our attendees for a high level of questions and discussion. Um, we will send out a email after this uh, meeting with a video of the presentation so that you can watch it again if you miss anything. And we will encourage you to share it widely. And as I mentioned at the outset, Mass Peace Action intends to convene a meeting in the next weeks to take up the questions of great power rivalry, US-China confrontation, et cetera. Uh, this would be Massachusetts centric. We wouldn't turn anybody away from another state, uh, but the idea would be to try to get some activism going in Massachusetts perhaps. Um, so with that, uh, I will, uh, and I, <coughs> Uh, in the message I send you, I'll ask you if you want to participate in that meeting to reply and we'll invite you to it. And we'll also include some of the resources that uh, both of our panelists as well as some other people put into the chat. 
so that you can follow up on those. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good night. And uh, onwards for the people's struggle. Thanks.